And how we know that God is in the house? God is in the house because he lives in us. Amen. And if you have not come to that point in your life where you have made him your Lord and Savior, there is always an opportunity to hear from him. I sent to you um, in a quandary. I have a message before me and that I... So just pray that whatever is said for the rest of our time together, that it would be what God wants us to hear. I'm wrestling with this a little bit. There is one of those moments where God takes us down into some places and we want to be want to make sure that we are at that place. Any of us have ever been stuck before? How does that feel? <laughs> Feels like there is no hope, right? And as we kind of look at where we are in our country, <clears throat> there is a lot going on. How many of us have ever tried to help God out in a situation? Yeah, many of us have tried to help God out. Because sometimes we think that he's not working fast enough. And because of our impatience, we fail to allow God to do what only God can do. Our country is in turmoil. And it is not the first time any country has ever been in turmoil. And so when it's in our lifetime, it brings a sense of hopelessness. And so I want to encourage us before I go into the sermon today is that even in the face of the things that we're dealing with, that God is still God. And God does not change God's self because of what is happening in our world around us. And we're going to continue in the series, Us, the People. And today we're going to talk about us being alive. And if, we will, if you will, turn with me to the book of Ephesians where we've been studying. Um, this will not match the outline that is in the bulletin, and, um, but we will stay with the title, Us the People Are an Alive People. And let's go to the Word of God, to the letter in Ephesians. And this is what the Word of God declares to us. I'm dropping stuff. Thank you, Lord. And the Word of God says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit is now at work in the sons of obedience and among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. And I'm going to stop there for a minute. You know Christian folks got amnesia, right? Christian folks have amnesia. And I know the young people will agree with me on this one. Because our parents got amnesia. You see, they forgot the things that they used to do. They forgot hmm, the things they used to do. They forgot the clothes they used to wear. 
I was looking through some pictures of my mother, Mrs. Clara Daphne Hamilton, God rest her soul. And would you believe my mother had on 16, six inch heels and mini. And it wasn't one of them moderate minis. It was way above the knee. And I'm like, Ma, what happened here? So folks have amnesia. And the funny thing is that, that sometimes as Christians, when we are in the world, we expect the world to act as how we act because we've been changed. But the only way a person's behavior, a person's attitude can change, it can only change with the word of God. And it goes on to say that following the prince of the power of the age, the spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all lived in the passions of the flesh. Turn to your neighbor and said, I lived in the passion of my flesh. Come on. Yeah, it's hard to say, isn't it? Now tell your neighbor, I lived in the passion of my flesh. And not only do we have amnesia, but we also have a revisionist history. We forgot the things we used to do so, and in this revisionist history, we lie to our children. Well, I didn't do that in my day. Hmm. <laughs> and, and, and it goes on to say, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and whereby the nature of the children at ra at ra of wrath like the rest of mankind. We did some things and we tend to revise the history because we do not want those around us to see us differently because the person that they see now have been one who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The one that they see now have experienced the power, the transforming power of God that has made us brand new through the Spirit of God. And so it is easy to revise the history. But some of y'all did not have Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat. Oh, Snapchat, the stuff disappears after a while. Um, Instagram, where the picture stays. If y'all had Instagram, I know some of y'all would be like my mother with them six-inch heels and mini. And all tabac. And I'm going, uh, put your hand up if you ever wore an altar back. You see, y'all know it's true. <laughs> but God, but here is the thing, and I got to get rid of mint before it's, you know, it just kind of falls out of place. But I want to kind of camp out on this, says, but God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us, hallelujah. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace. Somebody say grace. By grace you have been saved and been raised up with him and seated with him, glory to God, with him, seated with us, with him in the heavenly places in who? In Christ Jesus, so that in the coming age he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us. How? In Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and is not and this is not your own doing. It is the what? The gift of God, not a result of works, so that 
anyone may boast. For you, say, for I, I am his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. There it goes again. Created in who? For what? For good works which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. And the title of this morning's sermon is We Are Alive. And here's the question that I'd like to pose to us. If we are alive, then why are we walking like the dead? I'm going to say that again. If we are alive, then why are we walking like the dead? And I'm going to tell you how we do that. Now, can you imagine going into a funeral and you see a live person lying in the casket? Now, I'm not talking somebody. I'm talking a living, breathing person lying in a casket. What would be your response to that? Yeah, it's like, what? You don't belong in a casket. Someone who has died belong in this casket. And so many of us who are living in Christ are laying in a casket. And I'm going to tell you how we do that. We're laying in a casket because we are still involved in the deeds of our flesh. We are still doing the things that we used to do when we were in the world. Some might be still fornicating. Some might be having an adulterous relationship. Some might be lying. Some might be stealing. In the book of John, when, when uh, and I think it's when John the Baptist was introduced, he made a very important claim, and he said this, if you used to steal, steal no more. If whatever you used to do, don't do it anymore. And, and so I want to lay out a charge to us, get out of the casket because you ain't dead, because we are alive in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Paul writes, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and all things have become new. And so I want to begin with talking about this and, and what has caused us to be in this particular predicament, lying in a casket but yet alive. Sin has caused us to be in this casket. And we see it from the very beginning of time with Adam and Eve in the garden. When God gave specific instructions from, from this tree, you should not eat because the moment you do, you shall surely die. Now, we have taken that statement and we have, are making it more about whether it's Adam or Eve who sinned. But that is not the discussion. The discussion is that we have been placed in a casket because of the sin that was committed. And I'm here to let you know it's time to get up out of the casket. It's time to become alive in Christ Jesus. Jesus, ain't no time to be laying around in something that we don't belong in because these are the moments for the people of God to come alive because the world needs Christians who have forgotten all what they used to do and have submitted themselves to the power of God to change their lives. Lives. We talk more about Eve and Adam and blame each other. And yes, it is in the text. But let's move beyond the blame. 
and let's turn the mirror of the word onto ourselves so that we can get on up out of this casket. We see sin. It was because of Adam's sin while we all in a casket. It's because of that. I do not want to remain in the casket. I want to be walking about and loving God and loving his people. Sin. When we look at sin, we see sin in two contexts. First is the original sin of which I spoke about with Adam and Eve. And then even before there has any been infraction of the law of God, there is the sin that resides in all of us. Have you ever noticed your child could lie to you and you never taught that child how to lie? No matter how sanctified you are, no matter how much Holy Ghost you got, they lie to you right to your face. And you're saying, I did not raise you like this. But there is the problem of original sin that none of us can do anything about it until we come to Christ. Transgressions. Transgressions are things that are committed in open violation of the known law of God. That's how we stay in the casket. As parents, we want our children to obey us. But parents, I want to ask you a very direct question. Are you obedient to God? Parents, are you obedient to God? Guardians, are you obedient to God to then expect from our children and those who we raise to be obedient? And this is a question that we have got to deal with. And so the next question that we have to wrestle with in these next few minutes is why are we living like we are dead? Do you know that the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwell in us? Do we know that the same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us? And on that third day, I might say, that when the stone was rolled away and Jesus got up out of the tomb, let me tell you, it is that same power, that same tiny TNT power, that same dunamis power, that same power that, is, that raised him from the dead dwells in us. So therefore, there is no need for us to remain in the casket because we are alive in Christ Jesus. Boy, that would be an awful trick to play on my wife and my kids to lay in a casket while I'm still alive. It would be just terrible. trick that would be but can you imagine there are many of us who are lying around in a casket and nobody knows that we have been made alive in Christ there nobody knows that we have encountered the life-given force of Jesus Christ nobody knows that we have been made alive through the precious blood of Jesus Christ because we still laying around in our dead man's clothes the stuff that we used to do we still doing that pretending that 
you something. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm going to say to us, in order for our church to grow, we got to get alive in Christ. We can work as pastors and, and administrators and we can work 40, 80 hours a week, but nothing is going to change until we all get together and get up. Turn around to your neighbor and says, get out of that casket. There's one point that I want to make, and I'm going to end in, in about two minutes. There's what's one point I've got to make. And the thing is, what got us there, what got us there is our dis disobedience. What got us there is our, our inability to embrace the word of the living God. That is what got us there. But I've got great hope for us that the work of the cross has caused us to be alive in Christ Jesus. And it was, this is what it says, and raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are alive. Us, the people, are alive in Christ Jesus. Us, the people, are alive. Us, people have been moved from death to life. Us, the people, are out of the casket and we are going out into our world, impacting them with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we talk about the problem of sin that Adam brought into the world, the first thing we do is complain. Well, it's not fair. Anybody got kids, more than one kid in the house, when something happens, you know what happened? The first thing they said, well, it's not me. They point at each other. It's them. Right, Kurt? <laughs> it's them. But can you imagine if Jesus said that? And said, you know what? I'm not taking your punishment. You know what would happen if Jesus said that he's not taking our punishment? What will happen? We'll be still be in the casket. One of the things that I say, in the, if I would spend the next 10 years of my life pouring out my life into someone and into something and to say like Paul that I I've been poured out like a drink offering I have run my race I've finished my course I want to die empty I want to die when there is nothing left to give. I want to die when there is no more songs to sing out of these lungs. I want, to, I want to die when there is not one sermon left to preach. That is how I want to go out. But I want to say there are some of us in this room tonight, today, have so much in us to give that we haven't even begun to give, to pour out into the lives of someone else. Pour it out. Pour it out. Well, it's not fair because Adam brought sin into the world. And yes, I understand that. Now, if Christ is proclaimed, raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and our faith is, raised, is, is vain. I want to say that again. If Christ is not raised, then our preaching is what 
in vain and our faith is in vain. You see, if Christ is not raised, we are still dead in the casket. If Christ is not raised, but glory be to God, Christ bust the grave open and he was able to say to the grave, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? He was able to say that because he conquered death and the grave. Glory to God. And we who are in him have been raised to life in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. Turn to your neighbor and said, I've been raised with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but it is Christ who lives within me. I want you to know something. When on that day, when I surrendered my life to Christ, I want to say that Mark Charles Hamilton was no more. Oh, I want you to know that I have been raised anew in Christ Jesus, my Lord. So I want us to realize that we have been made new in Christ Jesus. So it's not us that live, but it's Christ who lives within us. And we now have within us the hope of glory in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. And in closing, I want to just touch something a little bit. In the text, and I've always wrestled with this idea when Jesus said to his disciples, now you just go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then I asked, what about us? And he's been showing us from beginning that he's always included us. But here Paul makes it very clear. But here is what the world wants us to do. He wants us to remain in the them and the use and not the us. We see that in our political arena. Yeah, we see it. We see it manifest in police brutality. We see it manifested in, in the wage disparity between black and our other counterparts. We see it. And every time we look around, it's always about us and them. The woman at the well, she made it very clear. She says, now look, I'm Samaritan. Some of y'all would say, well, I'm Jamaican. Yeah. You know what? My culture is one of the most interesting people. Uh, I'll talk about that later. But here is the point that I'm trying to make in every facet. You know what happens? They, they want to, it's us against them. The woman at the well, she made it clear. Now, look, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. But Christ came for the Jew and the Samaritan to make us into one glorious new humanity. And so whenever we hear these schisms, remember that is not them and, 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 and we, it's us. Tell them, tell your neighbor, it's us, it's us. It's us, us the people, us the people, we are alive. And so in order to get up out of this casting, we have to begin to one, appropriate the word of God accurately in our lives. Not according to our conjecture, but according to its interpretive process based upon the work of the Spirit and tested, tested. And not only are we, all, we must test this, but we are alive because Christ is alive in us.
turn to your neighbor and ask your neighbor if Christ alive in you. Wait for the answer. Wait for the answer. If the person says no, here is the opportunity to walk with them to the altar and say, hey, come and meet my Jesus. If there's the, here's this opportunity. Did you ask them the question? Did they answer in the affirmative? Didn't someone answer no? 